Uh, I'd like to ask a question specifically about Joe Devlin. Um, a lot that I've read about Joe Devlin is actually quite critical of him, uh, and you painted quite a positive picture of him tonight. Uh, he's usually criticised for uh, misinforming Redmond about the uh, the strength of the Ulster Unionist feeling um, and how strongly they were going to oppose Home Rule. Um, a lot of people say that he, he uh, underestimated the Ulster Unionist uh, opposition, uh, and then that went on to um, motivate Asquith's wait and see policy that Reese and Jalland really attack. So, did Joe Devlin really underestimate the strength of Ulster Unionism, despite the m many um, uh, problems that Mr. Hartley has has already described? I think the main criticism of Joe Devlin is that he was a blend of the good and the ugly. You know, I mean, he introduced, as O'Connell had almost equated nationalism with Catholicism in the 19th century, Devlin could be accused of introducing a sectarian secret society, the AOH, as an important element in nationalism and tying that in with what had been sold by Parnell as a non-sectarian cause, home rule. Um, uh, Devlin would have argued this was the only way to consolidate the, the Catholic vote, that religion was the motive force, and that he was actually disabling a potentially subversive movement, sectarian movement, the Hibernians, which had a murky enough history, and bring, putting them in safekeeping in a, a more pluralist movement, which had Protestant nationalist MPs. That would be a criticism. James Connolly would have said that the strength of Carsonism in the UVF was down to Brother Carson and Brother Devlin, referring to Devlin's role as Grand Master of the Ancient Order of Hibernians, which was as strong as Orangism in Irish terms. Um, misinforming um, Redmond, who misinformed Asquith. I think nationalists generally tended to underestimate the strength of unionism um, on the home rule issue. The general feeling being that um, there was a general view that only a minority of people would be prepared to take up arms against home rule, really. And it wasn't just Devlin was saying that. You had people like, for example, a Lurgan businessman, Richard McGay, who was a founder of the National Union of Dock Labourers, who was an MP for several Irish constituencies, who was a Protestant home ruler. He was also telling Redmond, I'm from Lurgan, I employ 200 men. No one's going to fight against this. There'll be a bit of a kerfuffle, but they'll get used to it. That was a more general movement. Um, but Devlin's nemesis really was the fact that in 1916, he did accept that there was a very strong militant tide of Protestantism in the North against Home Rule, and he advocated a compromise which nationalists, and he was the leading nationalist on that issue, said, look, this is six county partition, it's exclusion. It's temporary. After the war, we can look at it again. And anyway, nationalists can seek to win a Protestant support for a Dublin parliament as it begins to do constructive work. That's what he was saying on the nationalist side. And in fact, I hadn't time to read it, and I probably don't have it handy, but I actually brought along his letter to his friend, uh, Cardinal O'Donnell, in 1920, when he actually, they were close political allies, personal friends, and he said, you know, the worst thing that has happened in partition is the establishment of what is effectively a majoritarian Protestant parliament in Ulster, or in six counties of Ulster, with a permanent unionist Protestant majority. That is uh, really the worst thing, because there will be no coming together of these two communities, and nationalism will face permanent partition and permanent minority status, given the bitterness of Irish history since the 17th century. So yes, he probably did underestimate it in 1912 to 14, but he really became an advocate of a compromise. And if you think about it, if Ireland had been split in that softer way, that exclusionist way in 1916, before the violence of the Black and Tan War and the IRA campaign and the bitterness of expulsion from home and work that uh, our two speakers on my left have talked about, um, which has left such a mark in individuals, in their psyche, in their community. You know, I mean, there's no doubt about that. In the 1890s, people talked on the Unionist side about the recent massacres of 1641. They were 250 years ago, but they'd left a mark. We have to acknowledge that. If people are burnt out of their homes or evicted from their farm, no matter who they are, what community they come from, that leaves a mark 
years later. It's funny when you look at the witness statements, which are now coming online from the National Archives in Dublin, something like 1,800 statements of people who took a, a Republican position in 1916 and the War of Independence. When you look at the northern ones, an awful lot of these people are talking about eviction from home, burnings, that kind of thing, when they're writing in the 1950s about those events. Um, I'm almost, I, I know that if you look at Unionist archives and their witness statements of events, there are some in the public record office, diary accounts, people feel very keenly the hurts done to them in that period, you know. But I think that 1916 compromise, while Devlin wasn't a, a Unionist at all and, you know, a bored partition, he did feel it was a softer compromise which had checks and balances. A hundred Irish MPs at Westminster to defend nationalist interests. The unionist community felt they were still part of the kind of UK constitutional system. And he advocated that and regretted in 1920 that a worse system from his point of view had been legislated for. 